Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here today with Henry. Hello. And today is our next Vice Presidential Series installment, and we're taking a look at what number Vice President, Henry? 27th Vice President. The 27th Vice President of the United States, and what's his name, Henry? James Schoolcraft Sherman. You got it. James Schoolcraft Sherman, the guy behind us. Good old Sonny Jim, as he was well known. So, we've got some cool things to tell you about James Schoolcraft Sherman. But first, of course, what do the people got to do first, Henry? Hit subscribe down below, leave all your comments, questions, drop a like, and hit the bell. That's right, you got it. Hit subscribe down below, leave all those comments and questions. We love them. Give us a like and a thumbs up. And, of course, hit that little notification bell so you can be notified when we do release a new video. And, Henry, when is that? Every single week. He's right. It's every single week. He's right. And, of course... This Monday, we're recording this over the weekend, and in a couple days, it's, do you know what day it is? Why you have off from school? President's Day. It's President's Day, that's right. It's around the time of the year here in the United States when we celebrate the birthdays of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. So, happy President's Day to everyone out there. So here we go, next Vice Presidential Series installment here at Dead History. And it's going to be taking a look at James Schoolcraft Sherman, the 27th. And this is... Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you here at Dead History, here with Henry. Hello. The man behind us, the 27th Vice President of the United States. What's his name again, Henry? James Schoolcraft Sherman. James Schoolcraft Sherman, that's right. Some cool things to tell you about James Schoolcraft Sherman. He was actually born all the way up in Utica, New York. Yeah, upstate New York, not far from Syracuse. So he was born there and he died there. So he definitely was a hometown Utica boy through and through. No, oh, no, I said steamed hams. That's what I call hamburgers. You call hamburgers steamed hams? Yes. It's a regional dialect. Uh huh. Uh, what region? Uh, upstate New York. Really? Well, I'm from Utica, and I've never heard anyone use the phrase steamed hams. Oh, not in Utica. No, it's an Albany expression. I see. He was the vice president under. Do you have any idea? I bet you don't know this. What president was he vice president under? I'll give you a hint. This president was like. The heaviest, like he weighed the most out of any president ever. William Howard T Taft. There you go, William Howard Taft. That's who he was vice president under. Some cool things to tell you about their relationship, Sherman and Taft. We'll get into that. And another thing is, James Schoolcraft Sherman actually died of Bright's disease. Well, I think it was actually complications due to Bright's disease. But he did have Bright's disease, and we're going to tell you all about what that is and get into that. He also was the first vice president ever to fly in a plane. Pretty sure that's what I read. And he definitely was the very first vice president to throw out the first pitch, the ceremonial pitch at a major league baseball game. What? First vice president to do so, yes. So here we go. Wow. James Schoolcraft Sherman, our next vice presidential series installment. What number? The number... 27. 27th Vice President of the United States here at Dead History. Here we go. But first, Henry, they did the likes, subscribes, comments, questions, notifications. They did all this stuff. Yeah. Now what do they got to go get so they can watch James Schoolcraft Sherman? Go get the potato chips, the soda, the popcorn, the pretzels. That's right. Whatever you want to snack on. That's right. Whatever you want to snack on. Go get it. The drinks and the snacks. Because here we go. Next Vice Presidential Series installment, sit back, relax, and enjoy. And enjoy. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment as we're taking a look at the 27th Vice President of the United States, James Schoolcraft Sherman. So uh, some cool things to tell you about James Schoolcraft Sherman. I am flying solo, of course, for the audio portion here. Uh, but first and foremost, I just wanted to take a, a minute or two um, just to, to give a 
huge, huge thank you uh, to all the contestants uh, that participated in uh, this channel's pre presidential trivia that we had the other night. Uh, I actually had um, 10 different contestants. They are all historians and history content creators. Uh, just some wonderful, wonderful people. And it was a wonderful night. We did it on President's Day night, which was Monday, February 21st. So if you haven't checked out that video, go uh, take a look here on this channel. It says Presidential Trivia. Watch it. It was fabulous. Uh, the ultimate winner of the night was actually Kurt Dion. Yes, that Kurt. Uh, KD Grave Hunter is his Instagram handle. And then, of course... KurtzHistoricSites.com, that of course is his uh, website. Go check those two things out. Awesome stuff. Kurt was the grand prize winner for the night, so he did a great job. And then I had so many other wonderful, fabulous people, uh, you know, from all over um, that that participated. Nine other wonderful contestants. I had a uh, Don. Uh, Don Blaze uh, one nine eight five. Um, he, he was he did a wonderful job, uh, and then of course I had Joe Fakosh from visiting the presidents with his visiting the presidents podcast. Um, I had Eric from the Grover Cleveland Art Society, Grover Cleveland Art Society on Instagram. I had uh, of course Doctor Thomas Balsersky, uh, who is T Balsersky. On Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, the author of Bosom Friends, of course, that wonderful book uh, about James Buchanan and William Rufus King. Uh, then I had Heather from Project POTUS Pages. It's projectpotuspages.com. Wonderful, wonderful Instagram and website. Go check Heather out there. Uh, I had Lisa from Historical USA. It's actually historical underscore USA on Instagram. Go check her out. She also has a YouTube channel on here. Check her stuff out. Really awesome. Great stuff on the uh, revolutionary uh, time period. Uh, then I had uh, Cam from the Zachary Taylor Project. Uh, go check out the Zachary Taylor Project on Instagram uh, and all that stuff. Cam is... Truly a remarkable young man. Uh, he, he's brilliant. He did an awesome job. Um, re really well done. Uh, and then I had Alan. Alan from Learning Plunge. Go check out Learning Plunge on uh, Instagram. Some wonderful content there from Alan. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, Alicia from Dead POTUS Society. Yes, the coolest, best name on all of Instagram. Uh, I think it's actually dead underscore POTUS underscore society. But go check her out. She has an awesome, awesome Instagram. It's a lot of fun, uh, you know, of her travels all around, taking a look at historical sites and such. So just 10 fabulous, amazing contestants. We had a great time. I think truly and honestly for my first time ever doing it and hosting it, I think it went off wonderfully. Uh, there was no major, major screw ups. Uh, so I think it really was a great job and stay tuned. I've been getting a lot of feedback that people want to see us do it again. They want a, uh, trivia night part two. So stay tuned. That might be coming, uh, sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, but of course I'll be announcing that when it does. So thank you again to all 10 contestants. Really appreciate them. Great stuff. Uh, so now let's move on to our next vice presidential series installment. Like I said, looking at the 27th vice president of the United States, James Schoolcraft Sherman. Here we go. You will have to act on your own account. I am to be vice president and acting as a messenger boy is not part of the duties as vice president. James Schoolcraft Sherman to President William Howard Taft. 
A marble bust of James Schoolcraft Sherman has the distinction of being the only vice presidential bust in the United States Capitol with eyeglasses. Sherman apparently had thought that no one would recognize him without his glasses. However, over time, he has grown so obscure that no one recognizes him even with his glasses. Capitol visitors often confuse him with the more famous Senator John Sherman, author of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Yet, while he never authored a famous bill, Sonny Jim Sherman was a powerful leader in the House of Representatives, a skilled parliamentarian, and a popular presiding officer of the Senate during his vice presidency under William Howard Taft. Youth. James S. Sherman was born on October 24th of 1855 in Utica, New York, where his grandfather, Willett Sherman, ran a profitable glass factory and owned an impressive farm. In later years, Senator Elihu Root recalled spending summers at his own grandfather's farm and the big white house with the great columns of Sherman's grandfather's adjoining farm. Root believed that Sherman inherited his pro-business politics from his grandfather. Sherman's father, Richard U. Sherman, headed a food canning company and published a Democratic newspaper. Young James Sherman graduated from Whitestown Seminary in 1874 and then attended Hamilton College, where he achieved recognition for his skills in oratory and debate. His genial temperament made him the most popular man in his class. He graduated from Hamilton in 1878, received his law degree there the following year, and was admitted to the New York State Bar in 1880, practicing in a firm with his brother-in-law. In 1881, he married Carrie Babcock of East Orange, New Jersey, and they would have three sons. Sherman was a joiner. In college, he had joined the Sigma Phi fraternity. He was active in the Dutch Reformed Church. He was a member of the Royal Arcanum, or Arcanum, I should say, the Order of Elks, and of all the local clubs in Utica. In politics, he broke with his Democratic father to become a Republican and at the age of 29, won election as mayor of Utica. Two years later, in 1886, his district elected him to the U.S. House of Representatives. Except for the two years following his defeat for re-election in 1890, he remained in national public office for the rest of his life. So I'm just going to read a couple quick uh, things from other sources here. Um, same stuff we basically just said, just a little bit different. James Schoolcraft Sherman was born in New Hartford Village, New York, which was then a suburb of Utica on October 24th of 1855. His parents were Richard Updike Sherman and Mary Frances Schoolcraft Sherman. The family name was originally spelled Shearman, S-H-E-A-R-M-A-N. And the first ancestor on his father's side to arrive in America in the 17th century was Henry Shearman, son of Sir Henry Sherman of Dedham, Essex County, England. James Schoolcraft Sherman was of the ninth generation of descendants from Henry Sherman, a line also connected to Roger Sherman, signer of the Declaration of Independence, and William Tecumseh Sherman, 
the Union general during the Civil War. The family moved from Connecticut to Massachusetts and finally to Oneida County, New York, where James's father, Richard Updike Sherman, was born. Richard's father, Willett Sherman, was a successful glass manufacturer and captain of the steamboat Burlington, which was featured in Charles Dickens's American Notes. Richard Updike Sherman was a Democrat and quite prominent in political and civic affairs, serving as a state constitutional convention member in 1867. He was tally clerk of the U.S. House of Representatives for 10 years, and in 1853, he wrote a legislative manual that remained in use into the 20th century. He also served for 15 years as president of the New York State Forest and Game Commission and had worked as a journalist in Rochester, New York. James S. Sherman was educated in the Utica Public Schools and at Whitestown Seminary. His advanced education came at Hamilton College in Utica, where he received the BA in 1878 and the LLB in 1879. Sherman distinguished himself as a debater, and although not a brilliant student, was popular with both professors and peers. After gaining admission to the bar in 1880, he entered the Utica law firm of Cookingham, Gibson, and Sherman. Henry J. Cookingham, a former New York assemblyman, was married to Sherman's sister, Mary Louise. Sherman's role in the partnership appears to have been that of a business advisor, and he remained with the firm until 1907. Meanwhile, his father's career stimulated in James an interest in politics, but his decision to enter the political arena as a Republican was contrary to the senior Sherman's advice. An early effort to obtain the Republican nomination to the state Senate failed by one vote. Sherman's first political triumph was his election as mayor of Utica in 1884 at the age of 29, making him the youngest mayor in the city's history. One of his brothers had been elected mayor of Utica earlier on the Democratic ticket. James Sherman served only one term, declining renomination, as he prepared to move into national politics. Sherman was a supporter of the half breed faction in Republican Party politics and associated with the machine known as the Gang, which for years made its power felt on the Oneida County political scene. Actually, Oneida County and Utica had been the spawning ground of a number of outstanding political careers. Among them, Francis Kernan, a prominent Democrat and United States Senator, Horatio Seymour, Democratic presidential nominee in 1868, and Senator Roscoe Conkling, powerful Republican leader during the Gilded Age. The area was also the home base for Elia Root, who distinguished law- he was a distinguished lawyer and Secretary of State during the administration of Teddy Roosevelt. Root's father and brother taught mathematics at Hamilton College during the 19th century, where they were known as Square and Cube. Elia Root and James Schoolcraft Sherman became warm personal friends. Both men had close ties to Hamilton College and had belonged to the same fraternity. Although there appears to have been no outstanding municipal achievement during Sherman's one term as mayor, he managed to work his way into position for the Republican nomination for Congress in 1886. He defeated his Democratic opponent, Thomas J. Spriggs, who had held the office for two terms. Sherman's congressional election victory started him on him on a long and successful career in national politics that would culminate only with his death in 1912. However, a strong anti-Sherman faction soon developed over his support 
of the McKinley tariff bill and his alleged unwise use of patronage. This led to his only election defeat and caused the often critical New York Times to describe Sherman as a rosy-cheeked genial young lawyer whose political pull is based upon a native cunning rather than any reputation for ability. Except for that single election loss by a close margin in 1890, Sherman served in the House representing the 27th, earlier known as the 23rd, district until selected as Taft's running mate in the 1908 election. His career spanned the last phase of the laissez-faire gilded age and most of the reform-minded populist and progressive era that followed and during which he never wavered from the principles of the Republican Party's old guard wing. Meanwhile, Sherman's personal life and career were steadily progressing. He had married Carrie Babcock of East Orange, New Jersey on January 26th of 1881. Carrie Babcock Sherman's father, Carrie Babcock Sherman's father, Louis Babcock, was a prominent lawyer and her grandfather, Colonel Eliakim Sherrill, had been killed on the third day of fighting at Gettysburg. Carrie and her future husband had attended school together in Utica and had known each other since childhood. They had three sons, Cheryl, Richard U., and Thomas M., all of whom were destined for successful business careers. Carrie Babcock Sherman has been described as a regal Victorian lady whose gentle manners made her much respected and loved. She was short of stature, prematurely gray, with attractive round facial features. She was also solicitous of the well-being and proper accommodations of the Sherman household servants. When her husband was elected vice president in 1909, Carrie Sherman became the first second lady to accompany her spouse in the inaugural parade. During her husband's tenure as vice president, she founded the Congressional Club for Senators and Representatives' Wives. When in Utica, the Shermans attended the Dutch Reformed Church, where the congressman was president of the trustees and church treasurer. Upon his father's death in 1895, Sherman assumed the presidency of the New Hartford Canning Company and was also instrumental in the Utica Trust and Deposit Company's formation in 1899. Sherman served as president of this corporation, one of the most important financial institutions in central New York. A jolly coterie in the house. As a Republican committed to a high protective tariff, Sherman blamed his single defeat on an angry voter reaction to the McKinley Tariff of 1890, which had swept many members of his party out of Congress, including William McKinley. In 1892, Sherman narrowly defeated Democrat Henry Bentley, who had, been, who had beaten him in 1890, and returned to Congress. There, Sherman reestablished himself as the leader of a jolly coterie of New York Republicans. Speaker Thomas B. Reed, who enjoyed the company of these younger men, promoted Sherman in the House hierarchy. Democratic leader Champ Clark identified him as among the big five in the House Republican leadership, but Sherman never held a party leadership post or chaired a major committee. He served on the committee's on the Judiciary, Census, Industrial Arts and Expositions, Interstate and Foreign Commerce, and Rules, and for 14 years he chaired the Indian Affairs Committee. Democratic 
Representative John Sharp Williams believed that Sherman could have had a seat on either of the most important House committees, appropriation or ways and means for the asking. But the New Yorker always stood aside in favor of friends who wanted those appointments, thereby making the task of the speaker, who was in those days always the party leader, easier and the pathway of his friends pleasanter. The secret of Sherman's success in the House was his recognized parliamentary ability. Whenever House Speakers Tom Reed, David Henderson, and Joseph Cannon had to leave the chair, they knew that they could trust Sherman with the gavel because he was a decisive, self-possessed, and able parliamentarian. Unlike the smaller Senate, the House regularly used the device of a committee of the whole as a means of suspending its rules and moving ahead more speedily on legislation, since a smaller quorum was needed for the committee of the whole and debate was limited. Amendments could be voted upon, but the final bill had to be reported back to the full House to be voted upon in regular session. Officially known as the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union, this committee comprised all House members and met in the House chamber. To indicate that the House was meeting in the Committee of the Whole rather than in regular session, the House Sergeant-at-Arms lowered the House mace from its pedestal and the Speaker stepped down as presiding officer in favor of another member. Henry Cabot Lodge declared that Sherman gradually came to be recognized as the best chairman of the committee of the whole whom that great body had known in many years. Presiding effectively over the committee of the whole, said Lodge, was a severe test of a man's qualities, both moral and mental. He must have strength of character as well as ability. Quickness and decision must go hand in hand with knowledge and firmness must always be accompanied by good temper. While in the House, Sherman was a leader in the fight to preserve the gold standard against populist proposals for free silver by which farmers hoped to reduce their debts by fueling inflation through an expansion of the amount of money in circulation. Sherman also fought Democratic President Grover Cleveland's efforts to lower the tariff. When the Republicans returned to power with the election of William McKinley as president in 1896, Sherman played a key role in passage of the Dingley Tariff that reversed Democratic efforts and restored the high protective tariff. As usual, Speaker Reed turned the gavel over to Sherman to chair the Committee of the Whole throughout most of the debate on the Dingley Tariff. When Speaker Reed retired in 1900, Sherman sought the Speakership but lost to David Henderson. He became Henderson's right-hand man and continued to play that role until Henderson's successor, the powerful Uncle Joe Cannon. McKinley's assassination in 1901 transferred the presidency to the dynamic Theodore Roosevelt, whose strong personality stimulated a national reform movement that had grown out of a series of local responses to the human abuses of industrialism. Progressives demanded change, which conservative leaders in Congress resisted. Sherman stood with the old guard. He was preeminently a stand patter and proud of it, recalled Senator Chauncey Depew. Having inherited the presidency of the new Hartford Canning Company from his father, Sherman fought progressive efforts to require accurate labeling of the weights and measures of canned jelly, ketchup, corn, and other foods. He proposed a substitute amendment that required only 
that if a canner did label the weight and measure of the product, that such labeling must be accurate. This caused Dr. Harvey Wiley, who led the crusade for pure food and drug laws, to rename Sonny Jim Sherman as Short Weight Jim. The Republican Congressional Campaign Committee. Sherman chaired the Republican Congressional Campaign Campaign Committee during the congressional elections of 1906, raising large campaign contributions from business interests and gaining further recognition from his party's leaders. Sherman himself faced a hard fight for re-election that year. At one point, he turned desperately to an old fraternity brother, Elijah Root, then Secretary of State in the Roosevelt administration. Sherman invited Root to speak for him and for the New York Republican gubernatorial candidate, Charles Evan Hughes, who was locked in battle with the Democratic candidate, newspaper publisher, William Randolph Hearst. Other Republican leaders, fearing that Hearst might exploit Root's corporate connections to embarrass the Republican ticket, pleaded with Root to cancel his trip. But Sherman begged Root to reconsider. Root made the speech in which he strongly and eloquently denounced Hearst, an attack that was credited with helping Hughes and Sherman win their elections. In 1908, Sherman chaired the Republican State Convention for the third time, having previously done so in 1895 and 1900. His supporters then launched a vice presidential boom for him. President Theodore Roosevelt had announced that he would not stand for a third term and had anointed Secretary of War William Howard Taft as his successor. The New York delegation went to the convention, pledged to their governor, Charles Evan Hughes, for president. But as one journalist observed, the state's delegation was actually anxious to nominate Sherman for the second place on the ticket. Fortunately for Sherman's ambitions, Governor Hughes did nothing to promote his candidacy. Hughes's cool aloofness inspired a Gridiron Club parody of an old spiritual. Swing low, sweet chariot. You'll have to if you're after me. Swing low, sweet chariot. For I'm lying low, you see. Come on, you all love that. That was great. You got to hear me sing a little uh, little fun Gridiron Club parody there of, of that old spiritual. <laughs> uh, so a couple other quick things here. Uh, I already read about like his youth. Um, I did read here in eight, after 1878 graduation, he remained at Hamilton College for a year to study law, then continued his studies at the Utica office of Beardsley Cookingham in Burdick which included his brother-in-law, Henry J. Cookingham, as a partner. He was admitted to the bar in 1880 and practiced with Cookingham in the firm of Cookingham and Martin. Um, Sherman was also president of the Utica Trust and Deposit Company and the New Hartford Canning Company. Sherman became active in politics as a Republican. We know all this. He married Carrie Babcock of East Orange, New Jersey. We know all that. In 1886, Sherman was elected U.S. Representative from New York's 23rd Congressional District as a Republican, and he served 20 years in the House, four years followed by a two-year break, and then 16 more years. At a time when the Republican Party was divided over protective tariffs, Sherman sided with William McKinley and the conservative branch defending the gold standard against the potentially... uh, Really, really dangerous, what they thought, at least, free silver. Uh, It was basically, they they used to call it inflationary. 
Uh, during his House career, Sherman served as chairman of the Committee on Indian Affairs from the 54th through the 60th Congresses. That was 1895 to 1909. As Sherman had never held a party leadership post or been a chairman of a major committee, such as Ways and Means or Appropriations, he was considered sufficiently neutral to frequently be appointed chairman of the Committee of the Whole, a crucial device for speeding up the passage of bills by suspending certain rules at the discretion of the chairman. Henry Cabot Lodge recognized this job as a major test of integrity and judgment and declared that Sherman was supremely fitted for it. Through Sherman's efforts in 1900, the Sherman Indian High School in Riverside, California was built and named after him. And last, a couple other things. He was a popular stump speaker throughout his career, although during his, his years in Congress, he rarely addressed the galleries. Um, as an emerging politician, successful businessman, Sherman furthered his contacts as a trustee of Hamilton College, as well as serving as president of the, that institution's Washington Alumni Association. He was president of the Oneida County Historical Society, member of several golf clubs, Washington Metropolitan Club, Union League, you name it. Um, what else here? Uh, da, da, da. He, one of Sherman's favorite hobbies was cultivating flowers, and he always wore a boutonniere. It was Sherman's custom to be finished with breakfast before 8 a.m. and then take a brief outing either by buggy or in one of the three autos his sons possessed. He enjoyed playing golf and frequently attended baseball games. Sherman's desire to play baseball was only tempered by his stocky 190-pound frame, which limited his mobility. His amiable disposition soon led to the nickname Sonny Jim, which was attached early and remained with him throughout his life. It was said that he was a man of cheerful yesterdays and confident tomorrows. Sherman's national career began with his election to Congress during the first Cleveland administration in 1886. He was not known as a legislative leader or innovator, and there are few bills that bear his imprint. His main contribution appears to have been as parliamentarian. Here, Sherman developed a reputation for being fair and for his detailed knowledge of parliamentary procedure. He was, chairman, he was chairman of the Committee of the Whole during important debates, and there were few men in either party whose parliamentary knowledge was more highly respected. He often presided over the House during the fierce debate over the Dingley Tariff in 1897. Sherman was entrusted with this position by Speaker Thomas B. Reed, a major influence in the congressman's career. Sherman was also a member of the Committee on Interstate and Foreign Commerce, and despite the fact he was not from a western state, was appointed Committee on Indian Affairs Chairman, a post he held for 12 years. Other committees on which he served were the Judiciary, Civil Service, kind of went into that, and Census. Uh, Sherman gradually worked his way into the Republican Party's upper echelons and was a trusted colleague of House Speakers Thomas Reed, Davis B. Henderson, and Joseph G. Cannon. Uh, when his close friend Thomas Reed died, Sherman eulogized him as a lofty patriot, the great and representative citizen of the American Republic who has gone into history. Sherman himself was eventually regarded as one of the House of Representatives' Big Five, which included Speaker Joseph G. Cannon, Serino E. Payne, John Dalzell, and James A. Tawney. Champ Clark remarked that Sherman was the slickest of the bunch. A successful career in Congress led Sherman to aspire to further political ambitions. In 1899, he was nominated and confirmed for the post of general appraiser for New York. At first, Sherman accepted the position, but then he declined because he claimed his constituents wished him to remain in Congress. Shortly thereafter, Speaker Reed retired. Sherman entered the contest for Speaker of the House. We know that position went to David Henderson. And at this point in his career, 
Sherman may have entertained the prospect of running for the Senate. Uncle Joe Cannon, another close colleague of Sherman's, followed Henderson as Speaker in 1903. And all three speakers held enormous power over legislation, which ultimately led to a revolt against Cannon by House insurgents during the Taft administration. Sherman further enhanced his reputation by chairing the New York Republican Convention, we mentioned that, in 1895, 1900, 1908 and was Republican National Convention Delegate in 1892, and in 1906 chaired the Republican Party's National Congressional Committee. Uh, During uh, the 1906 midterm election, Sherman was instrumental in devising a scheme by which every Republican would contribute a dollar to the campaign. For a time thereafter, Sonny Jim was given a new uh, nickname of Dollar Jim. He also endeavored to solicit a political contribution for a good deal more than a dollar from railroad magnate E.H. Harriman, only to be curtly refused. Harriman, who was not pleased by Roosevelt's reform policies, indicated that he was indifferent to the GOP's electoral success. Uh, Republican Congressional Campaign Committee Chairman Sherman reported the incident to the president. The dispute that surfaced between President Roosevelt and Harriman had been festering since 1904. It tells you all about that. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole thing between Roosevelt and Harriman. Uh, kind of moving forward now uh, with, uh, with Sherman more. Uh, the episode, just a little bit more of the episode, became public in April of 1907 when a discharged employee of Harriman sold to the New York World a letter Harriman had written to Sidney Webster revealing the details of the 1904 arrangement with Roosevelt. Again, I'm not going to get into all these details. Um, to Sonny Jim returning from a cruise on the Spanish Main with House Speaker Joe Cannon received a wireless telegram from an unidentified source, J.O., ordering him to avoid all political interviews. Sherman found himself in the uncomfortable position of maintaining silence concerning his knowledge of whether or not Roosevelt had made a personal appeal for campaign funds. It was all about campaign funds with Roosevelt and Harriman. Uh, Sherman, you know, kind of got involved a little bit there. Uh, Sherman's congressional career came to an end in 1908 when he was selected somewhat to the chagrin of the party's Roosevelt wing as Taft's running mate. While there are a few who questioned Sherman's party loyalty or his organizational skills, some wondered whether or not he was suitable for the responsibilities of the office. So there you go. We're going to stop there because now we're going to really get into, in part two, his uh, nomination for vice presidency, uh, of course, being elected as vice president, and then his time in office as vice president, you know, his legacy, then his death, his gravesite, funny story of mine at the gravesite, all that stuff. We're going to get into that in part two. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this part one. Uh, I, I enjoyed, uh, you know, telling you all about Sonny Jim Sherman, uh, his early life, a man who rarely, this rarely happens, pretty much was born in Utica, New York. You'll find out died in Utica, New York. And then is buried in Utica, New York. So a man who was very closely tied to Utica, New York. Uh, Very rare that happens where someone's born, dies, and is buried in the same exact town or city. It's pretty rare, actually. So uh, pretty cool stuff. So thanks, guys. Thanks so much for all the support. Thank you for all you do. Keep all those comments and questions coming. Keep it all coming. The subscribes cannot thank you enough. All of this is not possible without all of you who watch and enjoy our videos and participate. So thank you so much. And again, a big thank you to all 10 contestants of our very first presidential trivia live stream from the other night. Thank you so much. And a big congratulation to Kurt Dion who won uh, you know, that presidential trivia. So great job. Thank you so much, guys. We will see you tomorrow for part two. See you then. Bye-bye.